Oh, man. I didn't think I was going to have to wear my glasses, but I'm, I've got to have to wear them because I can't even see that from, from here. And, and I apologize. You guys, I'm trying to become the most interesting man in the world. And it's, the, the problem is, as I was telling Mike, is as you get older, you, you go to Walmart to buy clippers for your facial hair, your ear hair, and your nose hair. And I haven't had to touch the top of my hair in like months, so I'm starting to, I'm starting to really show my age. But, but thanks to Mike and this, this name of this, Fighting the Good Fight, is important to me because I'm, I'm at this age and at this, the, the position I'm in, I really feel like I'm constantly battling. I'm, I'm constantly battling to get to greatness, and I know I'm never going to get there. And I, and I know that now. I've, I've kind of come to that position in my life where I'm, you ain't going to make it there, Lance. You just ain't going to get there. It ain't ever going to happen for you. But I want to get one step closer today than I was yesterday, and that takes fight. It really does. You don't get better by getting a day older in this profession anymore. We used to get away with that, guys. Just being a day older made you a day better. No longer. And so I, I, I've kind of embraced that, and I know a lot of you have probably embraced that as well. But it is a fight. And every day you wake up and you got to fight, just like the athletes you train fight. I want to see a show of hands so I kind of know who I'm talking to. Who in here is, uh, is working in the high school level? Uh, raise your hand, please. I really want to know who I'm talking to. Okay. Good. And the, and the college, the college level. Okay. How about private trainers, personal trainers? Oh man, just a perfect, almost thirds. How about you, physical uh, terrorists in the in the audience? Yep, a couple of you guys. I might slander us a little bit, so forgive me when I do that because we, I love our profession. But this is a strength coaching profession, right? So I might slander the PTs when I talk to the PTs. I slander the strength coaches, just so you guys know. So we we got to learn from each other, and so I'll, I'll try to spend some time kind of bridging, but my background's a little bit weird, uh, but ultimately I think what we're going to come out of this uh, talking about is, 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 is from my perspective, and my perspective hopefully is one from the practical as well as the theoretical, uh, and that it's this sort of this tipping balance in between the two that I, I really expect to find greatness at some point in this, in this field. We've got to have this balancing point, and if you go back 25 years when we first started in this, in this field, even in this NSCA, uh, it was very practical. And then if you follow the history, it kind of went full circle, went back into very theoretical, and now it's coming back to the practical married with the theoretical, and I'm very excited about the, the future of the NSCA because it's done this. Uh, so be, be understanding of where this sort of these, these things that I talk about now come from. I use the analogy of the practical, or the, what we're doing out there uh, in, in the space is uh, in, in advance of the science and the science in advance of the practical. I use this analogy, I used it last year, that science in our field is very similar, analogous to a torch. that sort of illuminates your steps. And so if we were going to take a walk from here to Dallas in the middle of the night, okay, in Texas, in the, in the heat of the summer, we would all agree we would like to have a torch with us, right? Because we, we don't want to step on a rattlesnake or step into you know, off some bridge into, into a chasm. So the torch is very, very important for us to be successful to walk from here to Dallas. But what is just as important for us is a compass and a map to show us where the heck Dallas is and where's the trail at to get to Dallas. And I think that's the relationship for us, I think, for science and practice in this field. We would all agree we would like to have both of these things and know how to use both of those things uh, to, to uh, navigate what it is we're trying to do, which is get people better. A, a, a better analogy came up on Memorial Day this, this year. I was watching that Saving Private Ryan movie, and you guys have seen that movie. What a fantastic uh, sort of movie, but it, it, it brought to mind the concept of the generals in the back that were on the ships when they were getting ready to attack uh, on D-Day, those generals that were back there looking at their charts and their graphs and their, you know, their, all the different kind of permutations of the possible tactics that they're going to use when they get out there. But they were sitting on the boats, right? They were sitting on the boats, and Tom Hanks' character was the, in the, U, the, the boat that opens up and the guy's firing the machine gun at him, right? So he's on the front line. We as practitioners, in a lot of cases, are like Tom Hanks. We're there where the bullets are flying and the bombs are going off, right? And some of the science is maybe a little bit back in the, in the ships looking at things at distance. It takes both of these. It took both of these elements to be successful in D-Day. And no disrespect to any veterans in the, in the room, I, I, that was just a very good analogy for me to think about the concept of the sort of the folks in the back doing the strategy and the folks that are on the front line in a very fluid environment where the bullets are flying. And that those two worlds in some cases are very different, but they must coexist to have uh, ultimate success in this field. So, like analogies. So what is intensity? 
the, the title of this was Art of Intensity, and this is a challenge now to the science and scientists in the community here. Right now, intensity is a word that has been thrown around for 20 plus years. We have ill-defined it, guys. I saw it on one, of, on one of the slides earlier, this concept of when volume goes down, intensity goes up. But what is intensity? I bet if I asked each of you what intensity means, each of you would have your own definition of intensity. So for me, this intensity, this is, this is truly something that needs better definition for our field, and I'll, I'll hopefully explain to you why, and in ways that maybe we're identifying it in our practices now, and what I've seen sort of globally. But this is the next, I think this is the next frontier, potentially, of the science to come along behind us and help us to better identify what intensity is, where is it, how do we measure it, what is, what is meaningful about it, what types of, the, uh, of intensity is there. When you, when you talk about intensity, these are the images that always come up, right? So if, you, if I said intensity, intensity, you might have your own images. These are some that, that, that I Googled, right? So intensity, you got the, you know, the military sergeant yelling and, and getting ready to hit this guy with, his, with a closed fist. There's always the words that, like, like blood and sweat and pain and bah, and, you know, there's always that, right? Um, there's usually, you know... <laughs> infomercials talking about intensity and I love insanity you know it's like you know, when, you know instead of the one to three rest interval it's three to one we're just going to invert the whole thing we're going to turn the world upside down because that's more intensity and that's insanity and that's it sells a lot of cool stuff so uh, there's usually flames involved uh, in most of the Googles interestingly like something burning this is kind of a new one is there's usually some sort of death like skull crossbones kind of you know that kind of stuff um, but but it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of this concept, I think, or this mantra for us in our profession that intensity drives this. This is the end result of an, an intense thing, right? That you're just, you, you, you know, this is me when I come home from work. I just, boom, I just don't even make it to the bed. The head falls onto the, onto the, uh, the couch. And in some ways, that that is good. That is what we're after, right? What is, it deals a lot with work. <laughs> And, and uh, the concept of working so hard that one day your, your, your name is going to be an autograph for someone. I have no doubt that intensity has to do with working hard. I'm going to challenge you today to think about the potential for There's a potential here that we need to work smarter and that we can drive intensity by working smarter, not necessarily always harder. That we may be working hard enough that if we smarten up that hard work, we can actually drive even more intensity from our athletes. And that's a challenge to you. And I, this is one of those talks, guys, that you're not going to walk away on Monday and going into your clinics and your, and your training sessions going, I'm going to use what he said on Monday. You know why? Because that would scare the heck out of me if you did that. Okay? Don't use any of this on Monday. I want you to scratch your head on Monday and take a really look at, at your stuff. And do I understand the intensity of what I'm doing? Really scratch your head and challenge your own stuff and then come back in a year's time, maybe, and bring that some of that knowledge to the rest of the crew. But this is not an application on Monday sort of a, sort of a speech, okay? Intensity. What's intense about that? Everything. It's black and white. I mean, there's a, that just reeks of intensity, right? But you have no idea. What rep is that, coach? One, ten, a hundred? How much weight's on the bar, coach? How hot is it in the room, coach? What has he done before this, coach? What did he do yesterday, coach? You have no idea. So don't tell me that's, that's intense. You have no idea what intense it is, how intense it is, where it sits on the intensity. You have no idea. Can we all agree? We have no idea. That scares the bejesus out of me, right? Because we know how important intensity is. We have multiple definitions of intensity right now, and you can Wikipedia it and Urban Dictionary it and all the time. I just came up with seven, and then I stopped listing them. And some of the definitions use the word intense in the definition. I mean, it's crazy. And I was like, well, golly, if there's that many definitions of that in the regular world, what about our world? Our world of strength and conditioning, right? The strength world has their definition of an intensity. In a lot of cases, even in the literature, they talk about that being a percentage of somebody's 1RM, right? That's the intensity of something. Strength coaches, can I have a grunt? Uh, right? Uh, right. You cardiovascular folks, on the other hand, the conditioning coaches of the world, you identify intensity very differently. You talk about it usually in terms of an effort required at a given velocity, incline, or work rate, and is expressed in quantities like 
blood lactates or heart rate. Right? So even within our own profession, we have two different definitions of the same word that is thrown around on every NSCA conference slide that I've ever seen for the last 25 years. Are you scared yet? How important is intensity? I think we would all agree. Whatever it is, <laughs> it's important. <laughs> But it has to do with this progressive overload. We're all kind of in agreement that we've got to have intensity to drive an overload so that the system, as we yank the system out of its homeostasis, that it rebounds, right? And it's better than it was before. It super compensates. Nod your head, yes, you agree, right? We've gotta, it's gotta be of certain intensity of whatever to be able to stimulate that. And if you don't, all you do is the same thing over and over. If Milo here carries the same weight of calf every day, the intensity changes, doesn't it? Because if he carried it today, and he carried it for a year, and it's the same calf that weighs the same amount of weight, and he carries that next year, what happened to the intensity of that carrying the calf? It get, went down. So you strength coaches, it's not, it's not all about weight, right? That intensity actually changed as his abilities go up. So this thing is a slippery sucker. It is a slippery, slippery sucker to hang on to. But we'd all agree that it's possibly the linchpin of what it is that we do to get people better. We must have intensity. We all agree on that. Different forms of intensity are out there. So this is how we start to kind of talk about intensity at MJP. So let's use this as kind of our language right now. It's not defined very well in the literature either. It's starting to be. Last 10 years, starting to be. This is just for our discussion today, and hopefully some of the scientists will come around and do better than I do with, with the, the discussion of this. But this is going to be the way we talk about it. Use intensity as a modifier of something. So intensity of, intensity of, the first one is this intensity of, let's see if this works here, intensity of load. Intensity of load or relative resistance. So we have intensity of load. How much weight's on the bar? Intensity of effort. For me, intensity of effort is what's the intentional speed? If we're just gonna use the weight training example. How fast am I trying to manipulate that bar? As an example, and please, I'm not just talking about strength training in this lecture. We're talking about other things. I'm just gonna to try to use some simple ones for this, but it's effort. How much effort? Am I just gonna do a rep, or am I gonna do that rep as fast and explosively as I possibly can? There's an intensity of effort. There's also intensity of exertion. Remember the rating of perceived exertion, that 10 point scale, right? 10 being maximum exertion. This speaks more to the metabolic demands that are at play, or the proximity to failure. So there's met met metabolites happening here that's transitioning. There's effort on the one side, there's load. These things are constantly intensities of, okay, and they're not existing in vacuums either. Faces of intensity, maybe in, again, two more terms that can confuse us. We use these terms interchangeably a lot, failure and fatigue. But these are the faces, this is the output of intensity. And I would argue, yes, that fatigue is a mandate to get someone better. You must fatigue the system, right? Failure is an end result, is an end result, or the, the culmination of 100% of 100 fatigue on a system. Failure, though, to you and me may mean two different things. In our program, failure is not laying on the track physically unable to walk, after a 100 meter repeat for 10. Failure for us might be defined as, and in our situation, is a lack of the ability to meet the demand that we're placing on the athlete for those repeat 100 dashes with a one to five rest interval. They missed their time. That is a fail. Is he laying on the track like his eyeballs are about to explode? No. He still what? He failed. So for us, for our nomenclature, failure does not mean near-death experience. And I'm here to tell you, you can take people to failure. Failure may be important, but you don't have to take them to this level of failure to improve. Fatigue, on the other hand, is this inability perceived or real to meet the demands that I'm placed on them. So fatigue is this constant thing. It's constant. It doesn't just happen at the end. It's constant. It's either 1% or 99%. And it's always in play. So when you say, ah, oh, an athlete is fatiguing, yes, they're fatiguing. From reps one to 10, they're probably fatiguing. And we'll have to understand what fatigue, it's a good thing, but it also has effects, hangover effects that are gonna 
change the intensity of other things. It's crazy how fatigue is going to work. So the take-home's there. There's the cessation of activity. I fall down, I can't walk. That is extreme failure for me as a coach. Failure may be the cessation of the activity because I pulled the athlete off. They were able to get 10 reps of the bench press. They only got nine with perfect technique and tempo. They failed at 10. They got 10, but they failed at 10. So failure for me is the cessation that I place on the athlete at rep number nine. Okay? Fatigue is neither zero or 100%. It's somewhere in between. And it's important to understand that as we fatigue, and you guys know this because you all train, as you fatigue, your effort has to go up, doesn't it? Your effort has to go up to meet the demand, even though it's the same weight. You're scratching your head. Why is he telling you this? This is kind of like the Matrix, okay? It's going to be kind of crazy here in a minute. It's going to get real slippery. But I just told you that a, the same load on the bar, strength coach, doing it two reps up to ten reps, actually changes intensity during the set, right? And we thought we knew what we were talking about. We were talking about intensity. It's changing while I'm What? Of course it is. So intensity can drive fatigue, but fatigue can change intensity. Here's an example of that. So here's a sinusoidal curve. This is a rep of, let's say this is a set of 10 reps. On the bottom is reps, and on the left is, is let's say that's maximum, let's say that's intensity of effort. Okay? As the repetitions go on, let's say we've got 100 pounds and we're doing a bench press. The intensity of effort to produce that rep is lower at reps 1, 2, and 3 than it is at 8, 8 9, and 10. Right, coach? So the intensity is actually changing, and it's not changing linearly. It's doing this. And you guys that train know what happens if you're using a 12RM load. What happens at number 11? What happens at number 12? I mean, it's almost straight up, right? So we've got to get out of our mind as coaches that it's just the weight on the bar for a given number of reps. This thing is slippery. There's also different types of fatigue, and fatigue is a good thing. It's something that's it's to, to be cognizant of that there are different types of fatigue. And the science is just now unraveling for us that there's different sorts of fatigue. We want to yank this fatigue down. I want my joints, my endocrine system, my central nervous system, my muscles to be better. I've got to fatigue those systems. Each of these systems requires a certain amount of stimulus over a certain amount of volume and a certain duration to replenish itself to be able to hammer it again. Each are different. The place that we focus at MJP a lot on right now is more of the central nervous system and endocrine fatigue. Because we want to optimize the intensity of the subsequent workout around knowing when those things are peaked, when they are replenished 100% or better. That's important. It's going to change your intensity. But we all know where fatigue lives, so we, we stress the system here. We stress the system here on the left on the fatigue where the performance level is dropped down. So you go in and you get after a great workout. Congratulations, great workout. You fatigued the system, didn't you? You take that stimulus off of them, what happens? You've seen the curve, what happens? The body, if there's no disease present or you're, you're not, you're not a, a very, very old person, a decrepit person, that should compensate back to regular. And then what does the body do? That dude might do that to me again. So just in case, I'm gonna get a little bit better physiologically in that particular realm, right? That's that super compensation that happens. We've seen this since we were undergrad. Fatigue is a mandate of this to work. So intensity drives some of that fatigue. And it's critical that we understand that this curvature is happening not only in our strength training, but in our endurance training, in our power training, in our plyometrics. There is a fatigue element to all of these things. And it's critical that we understand where it happens, how long it extends, and how deep to yank it to get the optimum benefit for our athlete. So that talks about modulation. How, how are we going to yank that rubber band down? And the first easy modification or modulation to intensity is the easiest one we all know about. And that is, hey, it's the, it's the load that we place on them. It's the training load. For this discussion, let's just keep it simple and talk about training load as a, an amount of weight lifted, OK? There's also training load in terms of metabolic load with now the GPS world that we can identify how many high intensity runs and deceleration. So let's, let's hold on that for now. Let's get this weight thing figured out first. Weight on the bar. So training load. We've got to understand the concept of relative training load, relative to the people you're training. If you like science, there's some science on this too. 
If you like the practical, I can tell you from 25 years experience now, the folks that have a lower training age, those that are newbies, less than whatever coach, uh, I think Kyle referenced to like a four year period of time, if it's less than two to three years, they're newbies to the field of strength training per se. They are young in the training world. The stimulus needed to pull them down to get that jump in strength is less to them than it is somebody with a higher training age. So in this room right now, 60% of your best you could do one time on that bench press may be a great stimulus for you because you just started last year. That same exact weight, that same exact percentage for this guy here that's been training with now for eight years is negligent. It's substandard. It's not going to get the same result. So if we're using absolute percentages to guide what we're repping these, these weights out, we're negligent. The science is coming back and showing it to you. And another thing this kind of speaks to is what we're seeing in, in practice is we don't have to load these newbies in the weight room as heavy to get the same max strength results as we do some of these long-term veterans. Isn't that cool? Because what's the best way to turn somebody off of the stuff that you do, high school guys? Bring that freshman volleyball guy or gal in and crush him on the squat, right? Great job, coach. Yes. Right? What have you done? You sent the signal that that sucks, that was painful. You could have used less load with that athlete and gotten just as much benefit. Now the loader on the four-year veteran of your program may need to be higher for the same output. There's both still what? They're both still strength training. Well, you're not using 85% of their one rep max. Dude, you are negligent. You're not following the science and you're not listening to the practice. You are negligent. You're, in you're an intensifier without any understanding of what intensity really means. That's a challenge for us. The other part of this training load is, is this concept of relative absolutes. And that gets really strange, right? You guys have all seen these charts on the left. Yes, have we seen this chart before? Raise your hand if you've seen a weight chart with percentages. Okay, thank goodness. All right. We used to live and die by these charts in the early days. We had computer programs that would kick out the number of, of, of repetitions you should do with a percentage of your 1RM. This used to be the, the linchpin of all of our strength conditioning programming. What we found out is that this chart on the left, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, the chart on the left indicates what percentage of your one rep max you could lift for a certain number of reps. For instance, if you could lift a weight six times and not seven. In other words, you failed on number seven, literally. The bar is sitting on your chest, somebody has to pull it off of you. That is a 6RM. That is roughly in the literature, 83% of what that athlete could do one time. What's the problem with that? That literature is based on a certain what? Population. What we found now is that that percentage can slide hugely depending upon your training status. Okay? So a 6RM to you could be very different than a 6RM to you, my friend. And I'm the idiot that used these percentages for so many years. Okay? So what we found out is that we can make relative use of these numbers and not have to use the absolute percentages and we'll actually dial in the intensity even closer. And what we started to use is some of this autoregulatory stuff or RM values. And so instead of using percentages, we're using the reps. So instead of that six rep at 83%, what we're going to have these athletes do is we're going to come in and do a six plus two RM lift today. So plus two means they could do two additional reps I'm only asking for six. So it's a load they could use eight times. I'm only asking for six. What I've done is I've taken a relative percentage of the percentage and allowed these two to regulate around that because his 6RM is going to be very different than this guy's 6RM. You follow? This is really cool stuff, and it's, it's kind of from the auto-regulatory world, and if you're, if you're curious, there's a lot of this stuff coming out of the USOC. Brian DeWeese is, is fantastic in this space. I don't know Brian, but I quote him all the time because he's a really smart dude, and he makes me cry in my beer at night. And he uses a lot of this stuff. Uh, but it, it's, it's the concept of we're going to regulate around the differences between these two athletes all the time. And Coach Mann and, and Coach Ivy at Missouri use it a lot as well. Not only are we going to place that plus two RM on these athletes, but we're going to allow them to regulate their intensity around those RM values. Because I'm going to have to assume when I'm using the computer to kick out numbers that these two guys recovered the same way this weekend. That's negligence, coaches. These are two different dudes. Okay, This guy 
went to church on Sunday morning, you slept all day on Sunday, you're highly recovered, you went out and had a binger, right? Okay. And now on Monday, the computer says you're going to do six reps at this percentage. You ready? Eh. You ready? He may be ready for more. We're going to regulate. So now we're going to allow you to pick in, okay, six reps plus two RM. Here's the load we're starting with. We watch the tempo and the technique. If he's crushing, we ask, hey, how many more could you do? I could probably do seven or eight. What are we going to do to the load, guys? We're going to turn it up. He ain't going to be able to do that, though, is he? He's probably going to come in and hit that sixth rep and rack it and look at me like, man, that's too heavy, coach. Are you with me? We're actually now drilling down specific relative loads to these two individuals. Some of you are saying, some of you high school coaches are saying, that's impossible with high school kids because they'll game the system, right? That's impossible. Nod your head yes, because it's near impossible. So it's important to understand where some of this science comes from. This comes from collegiate athletics. But the athletes are highly motivated. They're highly in tune with their bodies, right? So this auto-regulation is really cool. What we found at MJP is we found a sweet spot for this auto-regulation. For us, it's an intensity of an intensity. We use this plus two, plus three intensity as our kind of our sweet spot. And the reason it's sweet is twofold. One is it's a percentage high enough intensity to yank the system down or challenge it. It's not at 100% intensity. So instead of asking you to do six, as many as you can do. And then come back in the next day and a half. And guess what? Four, as hard as you can do. You're constantly working at what relative percentage? 100% intensity. Come on now, can I get an amen? Are you guys with me? That was earth shattering right there. Okay. Instead, what we found is there's a sweet spot that's below that 100% relative intensity that's plus two or plus three away from that six. What does that do for us? It gets us in the sweet spot of attacking fatigue, bringing that thing down, but not overloading. And what you notice if you get into that RM max percentage, sort of 100% relative intensity, what's the recovery time necessary to super compensate, to time up that next workout? A long time, 72 hours. My job is I gotta squeeze some density of training into the week. So I can crush your butt on Monday, and I can come back and try to crush you again on Wednesday, but guess what? That system is not super compensated. So what have I in basically done? I've intensified the next workout, even if I use the exact same weight. The next workout is more intense than this one was. Are you, are you feeling me? Another intensity modulation, it's gonna start going fast now, is time. Time can be in between sets or the set itself. And this is a sample Tabata, and there's that word intensity. They're working at 100% intensity. What does that mean? I have no idea. They're just working at 100% intensity. Okay, great. The idea though is we can modulate time, either time of the set or time in between sets and change intensity. So an example of this would be a Tabata run. This is the Helgerud run, the four by four run on the right here. We do that on our curved treadmills at MJP and everybody loves it because it's a four by four. We're gonna do the four by four workouts, four sets of four minute runs at a specific exertion level. 80% heart rate max, and a rest interval in between sets of 60 seconds. They love it, you know why? Because it just crushes you, right? So as a, as a coach, you have the choice. If I'm, that's the end game, that's what I wanna get, be able to do. You can A, choose to go in day one, week one, and do four by fours, 80% heart rate max, at 60% rest interval. What's gonna happen to your athlete? Try it sometimes, see what happens to you. You will either fail, like laid out fail, if you try to maintain that, or the four by four is gonna drive your exertion level through the roof. It's not gonna be 80% heart rate max anymore. Where's it gonna be? 90, 95, if you're able to maintain that rest interval. So for us, modulation becomes a regression. We're gonna pull backwards from that. And we're gonna build up to that, pulling back on the time variable. So we're gonna keep the four by four the same, so the volume is gonna be the same. We're gonna keep the intensity of exertion the same. What are we gonna regress back? that time intensity. And we're gonna build that back in to build them back up to be able to get something out of that four by four versus just using the four by four, the crushing workout as a six week workout. Every day we're gonna finish with the four by four until you figure out, your body figures out how to do it. I call that negligence. And I know I, I call that negligence for two reasons. One, it's not fun. So they're coming to me, they wanna have some fun. Uh, but, but number two, potentially, it's not as fast to progress, guys. Understand the business I'm in. If I don't get them better, they will go down the road and pay somebody else to do what I'm doing. 
So I got to get them better. So this is out of desperation. I got to get them better. And I know that will get them better. Using the time component, thinking about the end in mind. This is a progression we use at the Dallas Cowboys. Coach Parcells made all the athletes have to pass a conditioning test. And it happened to be the old two sets of, of 300 yard shuttles or the 50 back, 50 back six times. We called that sixes and it was two sets. And if you're a skill athlete, you had to make that in a certain amount of time, 54 seconds or less, and you got three minutes rest in between. Coaches, that's all I'm gonna ask my guys to be able to do when they show up at camp, go. So you as a coach, you have your choice. What would you like to do? Would you like to now, over the next 10 weeks, practice that test every day and hope that they get there? Or will you use time as a regression of intensity and build them back up? And in this case, the time was the time that they were having to hold the necessary speed. So think about that. Instead of doing sixes at nine second splits on the 50s, we're gonna pull them back, use the same volume overall of 50s, but we're gonna pull the time needed to hold nine second pace back to doubles or down and back. We're gonna do 12 of those. We're gonna keep the rest interval the same. We're gonna keep the speed the same. We're gonna keep the volume the same. But what are we gonna do? We're gonna extend the time factor. And what that does is intensifies it. So you go from doubles to triples to quads. Each of those steps are more Intense, that's what you guys say, intense. Is that making sense to everyone? I call that the Jurassic progression. That was taught to me in recent history, the last 15 years. Mr. Know-it-all here, I was a really smart guy. Until I had an old strength coach pull me aside and show me this. It was an epiphany. I went, are you kidding me? How did I not know that? How did I not know how to build that? That is art. That is art. You're looking at it, it's a Picasso. There's other progressions, and you can use the same thing for your 30, 20, 10 progressions, cardiorespiratorily, whatever you want to do, keep this in mind. It's an or, it's not an and. You want to increase time, stay away from volume. If you want to increase volume, stay away from time. Sometimes we get into the, that, you know, the trap of trying to make it a skull and crossbone session. We're going to shrink the rest interval, and we're going to increase the volume at the same time, because that's a harder workout. Any idiot with a whistle and a stopwatch can give an athlete a good workout. Okay? I'm not in the workout business. <laughs> I'm in the performance business. I must make them better for their sport. Yet I still have parents and, and kids coming to me all the time. Hey, give them a good workout, coach. I go somewhere else, man. We don't, we don't do that. We just, we just don't do that because I don't get paid if you go away somewhere else and get better somewhere else. Okay? and remembering fatigue. And fatigue is different for the different stimulus. Right? So fatigue is always in our minds. What is this doing to the system now and forward? And understand that these different stimulus have different lengths of this optimization of the next bout. So if we're doing that heavy strength training 72 hours before it's time to really hit them again, if we're at 100% relative intensity, if I back that back down with my, my relative intensities, I may be able to hit them again. That super compensation may happen again. I can get some more density in that training. Same with that tempo work that we just talked about, adding that certain time element there can change the intensity of when, not only when can we do the next exercise, but when is it optimum to do the next thing. Speaking on tempo, for us, tempo is now, let's talk about just the weight training example, is just how fast does the bar move? Or how fast are we intending the bar to move? Those two different things, right? And there's some science on this too. We've been seeing this practically for over 20 years. It's important to produce, if you're strength training in the performance industry, it's important for us to try to impart as much speed on a bar, let's use the bench press as an example, as possible because we get better stimulus for the rate of force production and even the maximum voluntary contraction, the peak force stuff we get, we get better when we do that. And the science is coming around behind now and starting to show some of that. So for strength training, intent on bar speed. How do you measure intent on bar speed, coach? <laughs> you didn't measure my intent, you just measured the output. Until we get into brainwave, you know, measurement and all that, you have no idea what your intent was, do you? Well, I have a hard time with some of the science still. Well, they, were, they told me that they were intentionally trying to, huh? okay, that's good enough for now, I guess. But the concept is, is key. And that tempo, the, the speed at which you manipulate that bar, changes intensity. This optimizes the intensity level for strength training. We've also seen it metabolically for our hypertrophy training. So when we're doing volume training or speed endurance or uh, strength endurance training in the weight room, we found that a slower eccentric component, a two count isoeccentric hold and a two count concentric actually intensifies it optimally for this metabolic cost that drives better hypertrophy. 
So it's not just how fast does the bar move, maximally speed, it's maintenance of a certain tempo. So what's the take home? You wanna intensify your workout? Mandate a tempo. And you've all done it, right? Do a set of 10, make yourself do a four count, two count hold and a two count up. And then do the same set of 10, whatever tempo you select. Which one's harder? Which one's more intense? When you make yourself hold that tempo or when you just select? Again, you're using tempo. You didn't add one shred of weight to the bar. You used tempo to intensify that movement, didn't you? And oh, by the way, you optimized the output. It's just better, guys, right? It's just, we're not just lifting weights. You gotta fight in this profession or you're gonna be left behind. Let's be better. Here's our boxes right here. So here's our, our tempo boxes for the different stimulus. So if we're working at volume, it's a 422. That's optimum for us. It's maximizing the effort. Isn't that weird to say? <laughs> we do max, I'm here to tell you, we do max effort lifting in the weight room every day. That, yeah, before this lecture, some of you guys go, whoa. He, he max efforts every day? Yeah, max effort with tempo. We're mandating tempos every day at MJP. Another modulation now, tweaks. Somebody used the term regression and progression. If you want to use that term, that's good. I stole the, the term tweak from a guy named Gary Gray. Some of you physical terrorists probably know who Gary Gray is. He's the father of functional training, self-proclaimed. But he's a genius. Uh, he was one of the first guys that started talking to us about what happens in the closed chain. The concept of closed chain training, a lot of it came from this guy. A lot of that transition from the strength world and the PT world. So if you don't know about Gary Gray, if you've never heard the name before, Google him and read some of his stuff. You'll, you'll find out in the first 10 minutes, a lot of it's way out here. But he had this cool term and he called it tweakology. Tweakology is the art of making, basically he liked to say making things fun. Basically it's making things more challenging to the system. And so a sample of different types of tweaks, there would be a movement tweak, a plane tweak. And I'll give you a quick example. A, a quick tweak would be to make something more challenging would be to take a standard forward lunge. Okay, we do the forward lunge. And you can do that for reps, you can load it, you can do whatever you want to do to intensify that. From his terminology, a quick way to intensify that without having to add any load would be to tweak it. And he would do a, excuse me, a plane tweak. So instead of a forward lunge, what might he add? Maybe a rotation. He might add an anterior forward lunge. He's gonna add some other plane tweak into that basic movement. That intensifies the movement, right? Didn't have to put a barbell on them. You could, but what would you not do? You would not do regular lunges forward, and then what? Do a plane tweak, and what? Add load. You double dip them on intensification, right? I'm starting to lose you. Tweakology, man. It's progression. Here's a sample progression. That looks really fun to me. I don't, I've never done it before. Raise your hand if you can do that. You guys are studs, man. It's amazing. What do you call that? Deficit wall push-up, right? Or deficit upside down something. It's really cool looking, and I would like to be able to do it someday. Let's say that's my goal. That's the ultimate end result of tweakology. And for me, I could use progressions to tweak up to that. Each of these are progressions to build up to that final family member, which is at the highest intensity level of that family. You, you with me? My perception is, and Gary Gray would agree with me, and a lot of you physios agree with me, is that if you're no good at level one of this tweak, chances are level two is going to be aberrant. And if level two is aberrant, level three is going to be aberrant. The analogy of you're trying to do calculus and you don't know what two plus two really is. Right? So tweaking back. So I could tweak backwards in the progression. Here's just another sample of a tweak from that same thing. So we're going all the way backwards. In this case, there may be a missing link. So this is where the art comes in. They're struggling. They can't go from this pikey push-up to that wall walk push-up. They're having a hard time. They're struggling there. I can leave them there to struggle where the intensity is way up. The fatigue is yanking way down and it's potentially irritating some other parts of my, of my training and maybe causing injury. Or I can add a link. Maybe I tweak inside the tweak. That's the art, right? That's the art of understanding that tweakology can progress or regress. Progress or regress. Tweakology. We do it all the time. We call them curriculums. The top end squat curriculum part for us is the back squat. We love the back squat. Everybody loves the back squat. And most athletes that come to us have already back squatted before. However, when we find elements of the back squat that we want to retune or to, to challenge differently, we'll pull them back or we'll tweak them back 
to the next distant cousin of this back squat, and for us, it's the front squat. And we've seen that the better you front squat, the better you can back squat. It doesn't always work that way, but it typically, that's the first step back for us. That's the first tweak that we use to de-intensify. Or, if you start with the, the squat progression, you want to start all the way at the bottom, we start with the goblet squat. And knowing that the goblet squat, when tweaked, if we tweak the goblet squat to a barbell front squat, that that intensity goes up just because we've changed the modality, we've changed the movement. Are you with me? And you're smiling because you're like, I know that. Of course you know that. Of course you know that. We even tweak our, our warm-ups at MJP. I mean, we even tweak our dynamic warm-up. So level one, dynamic warm-up, one of the first things for active flexibility, you know, the old need a chest squeeze. In place, repeat, same leg, level one. What's level two? Right, and then what? Left, alternating. Is that harder? Unless you've never done it before, you won't know, guys. Go out and try it. Why is it harder? Is it harder because it's a heavier leg? Or No, it's motor coordination, it's pattern, it's balance. It's harder, it's more intense. And then what's the third level of that one? Walking with it. If you suck at this, where do you go? You tweak. Let's do it in place first. You de-intensify it, don't you? And if you suck at that, now if you need to tweak it even farther, what do you do? And I'm sorry, you suck at that, right? What would I do to you? I might give you a balance out, right? I'm gonna keep tweaking that thing until I find a place where they can be successful and then intensify potentially through tweakology and that's in the warm-up. But everybody loves starting with the sexy one, right? The triple planer Spider-Man lunge with rotation, a reach on a BOSU ball with a boing in the other hand. Because that's sexy and that sells and that makes me look intense and that's what people want. Okay? Not for me. That's a workout. That's not training. Technique modulation. This is the obvious one. This is the obvious one, right? But think deeper than just a bad technique. This is a compensation when fatigue has overridden the ability to meet the demands, right? So potentially this kid on the left here, he's going to get the weight off the floor. He's going to be successful. What has he done? He is now compensatorily taking out the things that I'm trying to train, which is his hip extenders and knee extenders, and he's robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? He's successful because he's going to get the weight off there. So for me, at the root of it, from a performance standpoint, yeah, sure, he could get injured and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm not even worried about that. He's just not going to get better. Because what has he done? He's pulled off of the intensity on the things I'm trying to target. He's taken that away and put it on something else. Right? And what do we do in fatigue? We cheat, don't we? You cheat, I cheat, we all cheat. So in the presence of fatigue, if we're not mandating technique, which drives intensity up, we allow them to compensate. Okay, you girls are the worst at this. When you get tired on squats, what happens? We start bringing in adductors, right? Why? Because your adductors can help extend the hip. So what are you doing? You're letting your glutes go. Okay, the glutes are going, dude, stop, I'm done. Adductor, come help me because this sucks. Right? Congratulations, now you're training a girl in a fatigued state to compensate with adductors in hip extension. What are you setting them up for, coach? Congratulations, it's a big zipper scar on the front of their knee. You're doing it. You're doing it and you're not mandating technique. So you can drive the intensity of that rep of 10 up by mandating that that athlete maintains good technique. Just by mandating great technique, you drive the intensity of what you're trying to get after up. Pretty cool, right? Last couple here, timing. This has to do with organization. So how you organize your modalities. And this is a sample organization of an advanced sort of a conjugate tier system that we use with a lot of our college elite athletes. We actually train at max effort in each of those three buckets every day in a three-day split. So this is driving for us is squatting, uh, drawing is pulling, some of your pulls, your hip, your hip dominant stuff. Pushing, of course, is pushing. ERS is extension, rotation, stabilization. We got a whole kind of a vernacular that we use um, but at the end of the day, we're going to have a max effort drive, a max effort squat every day. That max effort may take place in the maximum strength world on one day, it's going to take place in the speed world on another day, and it's going to take place in the volume world on a third day. And the understanding of fatigue and the elements of fatigue and what it takes to yank it down and to optimize around intensity allows you to do some of that. Understanding that there's this concept of hangover. Fatigue has a hangover effect. So when I do strength training, 
This hangover can now affect what I'm doing subsequent to that. Speed training, power training. Look at the hangover effect on strength training. All the way out to four hours, a change in speed and skill. A hangover effect on your speed and skill work. So coach, if you have the exact same skill session or the exact same speed session placed before a strength training session or within four hours after, the exact same thing has now changed what? Intensity. And there's a genius slide I think Kyle put up there, or someone put up there about if you give, you've got to get. If you get, you've got to give. That's you're actually conjugating all the time. If you do this, understand you're going to have to do this. No, we're just going to go out there and grind. You're working out. Even within the metabolic demand, just that bucket of metabolics, there's differences. We're going to go out and run, you know, I think some, one of the, the, the lectures was talking about, we're going to run repeat 100s. Great. What's missing from that equation? We've got to be very, very clear. How fast is the 100? <laughs> what is the rest interval? Are you going to, well, how's the, what's the tweakology going to be on some of those times and, and tempos of those runs and those, of those inter, inter, interspersing of time? That's going to change the energy system. Whatever energy system you use is going to change how long the hangover effect lasts. We're just going to go out and run. That's not, that's not good enough, guys. It's not. Because it's different. If I go out for a more of an extensive run or an, an extensive lactic session versus an intensive lactic session, the difference can be almost a day of hangover. What energy system are you in? What are you trying to get done? What is the overload? Again, intensity is going to change. So rules of thumb for this that we've learned the hard way. Number one is we double up our central nervous system stuff. The high central nervous system stuff is our hard days. When we say something's hard at MJP, it's a nervous system hard, not a metabolic hard. Remember fatigue? Different types of fatigue? Central nervous system to us is hard. So we're going to double up the central nervous system stuff in the weight room with the central nervous system stuff potentially with our skill work or with our speed work. Those are going to be on the same day. Why? Because we know if we do it the other way, and I've done it that way, central nervous system hard, give them a what in the weight room? And if the central nervous system speed stuff was hard that day, what do we do? Weight room, we take it easy on them. Because then tomorrow, what do you get, coach? They're going to be easy in the speed work, so you can do what? Knock them out in strength training. So now you've got two back-to-back. -back. Now look at the hangover effect that you've created. You've now not allowed that athlete to recover, get out of that fatigue element into that compensation. So we stack our central nervous system and metabolics. comes after the uh, CNS work, and then there's no cure for the hangover. No matter what you read, no matter what cryogenic chamber you sit in, there will be hangover effects to your fatigue. Can we modulate that? Can we squeeze it? Certainly. Can we extend it? You go out and party again like you did last night? You just extended that hangover effect, right? We can modulate it, but we cannot cure it. So the last one, and this one you maybe hadn't thought of, and this is the one I'll finish on, and I'm sorry if I go over my time a little bit, but I think this is important. Time under attention. Not time under tension. So now get out of the science for a minute. Forget about science. Forget about reps and sets and all that mushy stuff that we just talked about. Forget all that. Because if you don't do this, all that other stuff's not going to matter. What I mean by time under attention is uh, it, it builds off some of the beliefs that some of us had in the profession, me included, for a long, long time, that technical skill, technical ability in this field trumped your interpersonal skills. I'm here to tell you I'm living proof that that doesn't work. I'm a living failure to tell you. I spent 10 years in higher education, five different certifications. I, I thought the answer was in the what? It was in the technical. I attended every conference known to man. I can show you a room in my house that is filled from floor to ceiling with notes from every NSCA conference ever done 25 years ago. I thought that was the answer. That was the proverbial linchpin to being great in this profession, being great for my athletes. Is it important? Absolutely. But it doesn't trump your interpersonal skills. It doesn't. And I'm living proof because I tried to do it that way, and I failed. So what am I talking about now? It's your intensity with your athlete. Your intensity of affect, your intensity of presence. And I'm not talking about the rah-rah cheerleaders, but you bring an intensity to every session that you work with your athletes on. What are you selling today? As I told you last year, what is, what's Nick Saban gonna ask you? What are you selling? You're bringing something. You're either bringing positive intensity or you're bringing distracting negative intensity. Or neutral intensity is, no, is not neutral at all, it's actually negative. What intensity are you bringing? We're not talking about the cheerleader stuff. In some cases, it's just attention to the moment, being mindful in the moment that this rep, this set of this exercise for this athlete is the most important rep, set, and exercise in the entire day. 
And when you feel that from me, guess what you get out of it? We intensify it. Why? Because he's able to survive through some of those fatigue elements. He's able to drive better intensely as the fatigue sets in. You're with him. He, it's not raw, raw. Yes, yeah, go spin it on. It doesn't have to be that for everybody. It could be for some. For some, it's just the feeling that he gets that you are so pressed into this rep and this set that this is damn important to you. And this is where you tourists kind of get me upset. Because you're over there doing your, 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 drinking your Starbucks coffee and you're doing your, your charting or whatever as you, you put this great workout together for this athlete and have them go out and do it. Switching on. Being switched on. Everybody's going to do it their own different way. Some are going to be charismatic with their voice. Others of us are going to be more quiet and reserved, but we're going to be pressed in. Know this, though. Even if nothing comes out of your mouth, your body language is going to tell the athlete how much intensity you're bringing to the, to the uh, equation every day. More than half of it's body language. Okay? How's your body language? What do you bring into the equation? Or the tourist coach over here. Man, when is this session going to be over? You're sending a signal to that athlete that is modulating their intensity right now. Every rep, every set. And if you think you're not being watched, you're nuts. Never underestimate how much you're being watched. It doesn't have to be in this in raw, raw enthusiasm either. That's not what I'm saying, although I love those coaches that bring that enthusiasm. What I don't love is when they bring the enthusiasm so that it's something that people want to come see them. What's the enthusiasm for? It's what the other coach said. It's servant leadership, right? We're doing whatever it takes to get that maximum intensity or that optimum intensity from that athlete. Whatever it takes. I'm really excited to be here. Okay? <laughs> you can try to fake it. Some would say you can fake it till you make it. Can you guys watch TED Talks? There's a good TED Talk on, I'm not very happy today. You can actually fake smile enough that your body starts releasing endorphins that tricks your body into thinking you're actually happy. Isn't that nuts? But I promise you, if you're this guy, you're just faking it. You're putting the pom-poms on saying, go team, go. They're going to pick up on it, and they're going to know it's, in, it's insincere. And you tourists, it's going to be hard for you to figure this out. We don't have any in here. The tourists out there, they're going to have a hard time figuring this out because they have no idea what we're talking about. Why would you get so excited about that? Because I love this profession. Because I love it, you don't get it. You don't understand, bro. And that's okay. Go find your passion and do that, and then you'll understand. But right now, you're not getting it. The easiest way to modulate intensity. When you go back to work on Monday, you can try this, and it'll work. It'll work wonders. Stop being such a coach all the time. Well, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to get your butt back. You need to get your elbows up. You need to... You're coaching, right? That's what you're here to do. You learned that. Do this first. Start catching your athletes doing something right tomorrow. You'll instantly see a modulation in the intensity that athlete will give you. I promise you, I guarantee you. Catch your athletes doing something right. You head coaches, catch your assistant coaches doing something right. I suck at that. I'm the world's worst head coach right now because I don't catch my people doing something right. My coaches are my athletes now. And I'm working at this every day. But I promise you, it'll help you. At the end of it, guys, we're plate spinners. For those of us that are in the performance industry, we're not working with one-on-ones necessarily. We're working on 9, 10, 15 athletes at a time. It's very different, this time under attention. You guys seen the plate spinner in the Mavericks game? You ever seen it? He'll get 12 plates going. Are you with me? You know what I'm talking about, right? So he'll get 12 plates are going. And this one plate over here, he has to keep going over and spinning that one. He'd only have to spin this one like once. And that thing's just going. And I'm like, how's that, how's that going? This one over here on the left-hand stage, he just keeps having to go over. It's like your athletes, right? When you're training in groups, some are requiring more attention than others to keep all the plates spinning. And while you're over here coaching this one plate, you do this, you do that, all these plates could be falling off. And so you've got to be able to own the entirety of that plate spinning apparatus all the time knowing that there's a modulation that's going on with your time under attention depending upon the plate. At the end of it, guys, that time under attention, it should be about the athlete, not about you. They're coming to get from you. They're not coming to watch you on stage. This is about 
the athlete. Guys, I love this profession, and, and I love the fact that I get to come and tell you what I'm passionate about. I'm so humbled to be here. Please, if you disagree with me, call me. If you, if you hated it, call me. If you, if you loved it, call me. Let's talk. Let's add the contact list because I get the impression that you guys are pressed in and switched on and, and passionate about this space as well. And that's what we need. Next year, you bring a friend and this place is twice as full. Thank you guys very much.